Good morning. Thanks for being in Bible class this morning. It is time for us to get started. We'll begin with a, a word of prayer. Well, if I can get everything caught up here, there we go. Would you bow with me as we get started? God, our Father, we're grateful to come before you this morning. Thank you for this day. It is your day, and we come to worship you. It is a privilege to come into your presence, to honor you as the almighty, all-knowing God and our heavenly Father. Thank you that you hear our prayer. God, as we come in this morning, we are mindful of so many that are on our hearts, many that are sick, that are recovering. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with Sandra Baird as she recovers from her surgery for thyroid cancer. We pray that that would be a good procedure and that she would recover and get back to her desired life. And Father, we pray you'd be with Alan Smith as he recovers from his heel problems and the injection he's had there. And there are so many others that are on our prayer list and each individually that we know. God, we know you are the God of healing and we ask that you would bring healing and restoration to those who are sick and hurting, that you would bring comfort to those who are grieving. And yet, Father, as we are reminded of the brokenness of this world, we look around and see world events. Father, we pray for peace in places of war, whether it be Ukraine or the Middle East. We pray for strength for those who are suffering in so many different situations under natural disasters and also under human oppression. And yet, God, all of that causes us to look at you and look at heaven and say, come, Lord Jesus. We eagerly anticipate your return. We long for the perfection you have in store for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you inspired it and preserved it so that we can study it today during our Bible class time so that we can learn from it and live the life you've called us to live. Father, we ask that you give us wisdom as we study. Be with our time now. Bless us as we study your word. And Father, strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get into our lesson, we are still collecting. We are, our youth group is going to be uh, getting Christmas for seven kids so far, although we're around halfway to that goal. And uh, as you know from years past, Josh has the opportunity to add kids to that, so I anticipate that number may go up. But uh, if you would like to contribute to that, our youth group goes shopping and, and they buy things for those kids that are then given to them so that they can have a Christmas they wouldn't otherwise have. And uh, we, we kind of get a balance between things they need and things they want. And that's a, a really good thing that our, our youth group gets to do. If you'd like to give toward that, I'm going to start it over here with Janie and we'll just pass it all the way back around. And uh, if you'd like to contribute to that, feel free. We'll do that all through our Bible classes Sundays and on Wednesdays up until I believe it's December the 13th. I'm going off memory there. But uh, somewhere in there we'll tell you when the last chance to give might be. If you got your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 17, Matthew 17, I got caught by the bell last week, we were right in the middle of a lesson, in Matthew 17 we've been kind of, we've seen Peter, we, we've looked at people responding to him, we saw the Mount of Transfiguration and the powerful experience there, we saw them come down from the mountain and a boy that was healed that the disciples couldn't heal, but Jesus did. And we talked some about the lesson that we learned that it's a focus on Jesus. And then Jesus turned around and began to teach them yet again that the Son of Man was going to be betrayed and that he would be killed and on the third day be raised up. And we noted that this time Peter didn't correct Jesus. Last time Jesus said that, Peter said, hey, Jesus, you got to quit talking. He rebuked. Uh, Jesus. And, and this time they were exceedingly sorrowful. They still don't understand. They're still struggling to grasp what Jesus means by this. But Peter's learned enough to say, all right, I'm not going to rebuke Jesus. And in verse 24, they'd come to Capernaum and those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And so we talked some about that temple tax. It had been uh, a tax that it wasn't always levied, but by Peter's day, it was a pretty regular thing. And they were accustomed to paying that two drachma tax. The Roman coin for that was considered a stator. And so they were accustomed to paying that. The tax went toward those temple officials. And when it was to be collected, they sent people out to collect it. And so here come the tax collectors. And this is different from the, the tax collectors we read about that are Roman tax collectors. These are Jewish ones collecting for the temple. The Jews considered it an honor to pay this tax. It was their patriotic duty to pay this tax. 
And, and so they come and they say, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter immediately says, yes, probably over the course of three years, he's seen this happen before. And he knows that Jesus does, in fact, pay that tax. So he says, yes. And, and then he heads into the house because he's going to tell Jesus, hey, they say, we, you know, our temple tax is due. We need to pay that. And in verse 25 of Matthew 17, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon, from whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? He talks about the two different types of taxes. Customs were taxes based on goods. They, they were taxes uh, that, that were levied on uh, uh, goods that were sold, goods that were imported. A poll tax specifically was a, a payment of tribute based on population. And so those were kind of the two types of taxes that governors took. And Jesus says, from whom do the kings of earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? And Peter says, verse 26, from strangers. You don't tax your family, you tax your people. And so Peter says from strangers, and Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. What does he mean by that? Yeah, Jesus says, let's just think about earthly kings and earthly kingdoms. And if the king proclaims a tax in the land and says, hey, you know, if you're going to travel this road, you have to pay a poll tax. And, and based on the goods that you bring in and sell, you pay an income tax. Does his own son pay that tax? If he wants to travel that road, do the guards stop him and charge that tax? No. It's the king's road. It's the king's tax. He doesn't pay the tax. He receives the tax. He's part of the royal family. And, and so... Peter says, no, of course, it's from strangers. It's from those outside his family. And Jesus says, so let's make the point here. In any earthly kingdom, the sons of the king are free from taxation. So what's his point? He's the son of the king. The temple tax, it was paid to those temple officials. It was for the upkeep and, and maintenance of the temple and, and the care for the priests who cared for the temple. But the Jews considered that a tax that they paid to God. It was a, a gift that they gave to, to support the work of the Lord. And Jesus said, do you think if I'm the son of God that I should have to pay the tax to God the Father? Absolutely not. Jesus, or Peter has already had the realization, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He's begun to put that together. Jesus said, Peter, I want you to think about what that means. If I'm really the son of God, what does that mean? And so Jesus declares he is free from the tax. What do you think would happen next? Don't look at the story. What do you think would happen next? Peter, I don't have to pay the tax because I'm the son of God. We've been walking through Matthew for a while. You know Peter. You know Jesus. What would you expect Peter to do? So Colby says Peter's going to argue, Jesus, you still got to pay the tax. This, we're, we're in absolute opinion here, so my opinion and Colby's opinion are equally valid completely. But I kind of think Peter's going to head back out to those guys and say, hey, actually, guys, he doesn't have to pay. He's the son of God. Peter kind of has this, um, we've talked about it before, his ready, fire, aim approach to speaking. He, he doesn't engage his brain until after he's already engaged his lips. And I think Peter might just go running back out to those guys and say, wait, 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 he doesn't have to pay. And you would expect Peter to say, Jesus said he doesn't have to pay because he's the son of God. And Peter's going to kind of jump up and use that as a teachable moment. Jesus knows that wouldn't end well. And so before he even gets a chance to say anything, I love that Jesus just keeps right on talking. Then the sons are free, nevertheless. Before you say anything, Peter, before you go anywhere. Nevertheless... Lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you've opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for, you, for me and you. So before we look at the miracle that happens here, just take a moment. Jesus said, I don't have to pay the tax. And then what does he do next? Pays the tax. He pays the tax for himself and for Peter as well. I'm exempt 
but I'm going to pay it anyway. And why does he do that? Not to offend, Rodney says. Yeah, Jesus says, look, nevertheless, uh, lest we offend those temple officials, you just go pay the tax. So is Jesus a pacifist who always says, hey, whatever it is, I just want to keep the peace, don't want to make any trouble, don't want to make any waves, let's not offend anybody? Is that his motto? So you guys are all saying no, but he just said, I don't owe this tax, but I'm going to pay it anyway just to keep the peace. John? So yeah, John points out that when Jesus did these miracles of healing, frequently we've seen him say, hey, don't tell anybody. Don't tell this, you know, you go show yourself to the priest, you, you go your way and sin no more, but, but don't tell anybody. It wasn't the right time yet. There's this messianic secret. And, and so part of that is, Peter, if you go running out there right now and hollering at them that I'm, it's not the right time. Yeah. So, so, yeah, John says, or, you know, if you offend them, there's consequences that come. Colby? So Colby dips into the next chapter, actually. What you're talking about is the very next thing that, that Jesus is going to say. That, that Jesus says, hey, we don't cause another brother to sin or to stumble. And so Jesus, you know, Colby says maybe Jesus is just saying, look, by my example, I don't want to lead others astray. So I'm going to do something even though I don't have to. I'm going to give up some of my freedoms even though I don't have to to set a good example for those who are obligated. And, and certainly that would be in keeping with his example. So Keith? So, yeah, there, there's a, to keep others from being ignorant of, of what's going on and all that. So Jesus says, we're going to pay the tax. I, I'm going to give up. I'm going to surrender this freedom. And, and even though it costs me, I'm going to pay the tax. And, and, you know, Colby, I think he does set a good example for others who really did have to pay the tax. But he sets a good example for Peter, too. For those who knew everything that, hey, he didn't owe this, but he did it anyway. Boy, you get to see a, an example of, of what Jesus really felt. And so he tells Peter to do something really, really unique. This miracle has so many things in it that are the only time they happen. So he tells Peter, go to the sea and cast in a hook. It's the only time you read about fishermen using a hook. What do they normally use? Nets, yeah. If you fish for a living... You use a net because you can catch a lot more fish, and that's important for your livelihood. If you fish for recreation, you use a hook because you can only catch one at a time that way. But this time, Peter just needed one fish. So he says, you go and, and cast in a hook. It's the only time Peter's, uh, that we see uh, a fisherman using a hook. And he says, when you get the fish, and it's the only time Jesus' miracle about fish and fishing has one fish in it. Every other time, it's a net full of fish. When you take the fish up that comes up first, and when you've opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money. It, literally there the, that you will find the, the, the proper amount there, the, the stator, the four drachma, to pay two of our taxes. You'll find a piece of money. It's the only miracle of Jesus's that involves money, that, that directly involves currency. And then take that and give it to them for me and you, it's the only miracle Jesus does that in any way directly benefits himself. And, and so all of those things have, have led folks to ask a lot of questions. But, but honestly, I, I think it sets a great tone. Colby already pointed out the example. Go pay the tax for me, except I don't owe the tax. So I'm paying the tax really as a favor to say I'm not going to make trouble, I'm not going to offend. Jesus was not a, a peace-loving at, at all costs kind of guy, but he also was not out to offend just for the sake of offense. In this case, he said it's better off to pay the tax. That won't focus people on the message like it should if I don't pay the tax. So, so Jesus pays the tax, and he pays for Peter too, Colby.
Absolutely. I mean, I think all of that. And so part of what you learn is here is the father who pays the tax anyway, but he doesn't just pay it for his son, he pays it for Peter as well. And so what God requires, what God asks, he also provides for. The king's children can pay the tax because the king gives them the money to. And so Peter pays the tax, which by the way, that's another thing that happens with this miracle. There's no record of Peter actually going and doing any of this. Usually the miracle, when, you say, when Jesus says, go do this, then we say, they went and did it, and they were healed. Or they, Jesus just tells Peter to go do it, and everyone assumes that's exactly what happened, that Peter did that. But technically it's not written down, which is a unique feature of, of this miracle as well. Keith? We don't assume that what it says means to disobey law. So, that's right. And in this case, you know, Keith points out in Romans where Paul talks about we obey man's law. Now, this is not man's law. This was God's law that he commanded. This temple tax came from God. Uh, so, so this was a, a direct command of God. But you're right, Paul's going to argue, hey, we pay our taxes to the Romans as well. And when Jesus is confronted about the Roman taxation, he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So uh, certainly we do that as well. Chapter 18 continues and says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, what's your first reaction when the disciples ask that question? You've been reading along in Matthew. We've been following the disciples, and they say, all right, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus? They're expecting it to be one of them. Well, we'll see his answer in a minute. They don't expect that answer, Keith, I guarantee you. Keith said the lowliest, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But they said, who's the greatest? And my first thought is, I bet Jesus just slaps his forehead. Again? We've had this discussion. But have we? I think if we look carefully, we see a little bit of growth in the disciples. The last time we had this discussion, they were arguing among themselves. I'm the greatest. No, uh I'm the greatest. No, uh y'all are both wrong. I'm the greatest. They were fighting among themselves, and Jesus enters into the discussion. They've learned something. Don't fight amongst ourselves. Let's just ask Jesus. Hey, that's not... That's not bad theology, right? If you got a question, I don't know, good teachers say there's no such thing as a bad question, right? The only bad question is the one you don't ask. So, so admittedly, this is a bad question. They're off base, okay? Let, let's just acknowledge that. But even then, when they have a bad question, their reaction is now being, let's go ask Jesus. Man, what if we adopted that? Because who do we tend to ask? If you got something you don't know about the Bible, Google. Yeah, Google is God, man. We're going to whip out our phones and, you know, where does it say, did Jesus really or whatever, you know, we're, we're going to ask Google. And their first thought was, let's ask Jesus. They've learned. They've grown. They, that's a new step in their faith. In fact, it says that, that, you know, the indication here is they brought it to Jesus. The subject came up, and I don't know how it all played out, but instead of fighting about it and Jesus having to come break up the fight, they come to him. Say, all right, Jesus, we know you've got some thoughts on this. Who's the greatest? Is there anything wrong with wanting to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> yeah, we're unsure. So, so Keith just says, yeah, there is. And Elian's like, I mean, it's kind of like bragging that you're humble. Yeah, okay. But, but wouldn't you like, if God said, I am looking out and I, I'm going to find the best Christian, would you hope he'd look at you? W would you like to, you know, at least make the first cut? I mean, if God was to look at it and say, I'm looking for my servants with whom I'm well pleased. Let's put it that way. We'll use Bible language there. I'm looking for servants with whom I'm well pleased. Do you want to be on that list or would you rather be left off that list? Man, I went on it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, so Brad has cut to the heart of the matter. Brad says it appears that they have more of a powerful idea of who, who's going to, you know, who am I going to outrank? Who am I going to be better than? Who do I get to boss around? You can't tell me what to do because I'm the number three guy in the kingdom of heaven and you're the number five guy in the kingdom of heaven. And, and there seems to be some attitude of that. Pride, yeah, there, there's some pride in all of this. That, that is certainly what Jesus is about to absolutely hammer them on. But let's not fault them for wanting to be considered a great follower of Jesus. We should all hope to be a great follower of Jesus. Paul can say, follow me as I follow Christ. That's a pretty powerful statement to make. And, and so... Yeah, and so we can hope to, you know, Jesus himself says a disciple is like his teacher. Man, I, I, I want to get better and better at that. And, and I hope if I get enough time that I get better and better and better and better at following Jesus. So they say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's not a bad question to ask. Brad's exactly right, though. We have history with these guys. We know how this argument plays out. We're suspect. You know, it, it's the difference between you get a phone call and you answer the phone and somebody says, hey, what are you doing right now? Oh, depending on who's on the other end of that phone call, it, it's a very different answer, right? Is it one of those folks who are going to say, great, I need this, I need that from you, I'll be right over? Or is it somebody who might say, well, I'm free for lunch today, you want to go to lunch? Well, it depends. We've got history with these folks. When they say who's the greatest, we're like, oh, guys, again, we've seen this before. And Jesus knows their hearts. And so look at what he does. Verse 2, Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them. The disciples are still struggling with the nature of the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, let's do an object lesson. Now, that's a common thing for a rabbi to do. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And most any of the rabbis would have said, let's consider Abraham. Let's consider Moses. What does it take to be a, a great soldier for the Lord? And they might have said, you know, here's this great military hero. Let's look at his life and draw some parallels. That was a common rabbinical thing to do. And Jesus calls a child. You want your hero? It's a child. And this is one of those moments where we have to work really, really, really hard to step away from our 2023 Western view of children. We love kids. We celebrate kids. We take care of kids. We pass all kinds of laws just for kids. In fact, we say if you commit a crime against a kid, that might be two crimes. We'll charge you twice because you committed a crime against someone young and innocent and all of that. We value our children. We protect our children. None of that happened in Jesus' day, in that culture. Children were a liability. Why would children be a liability? Future. What's that? Future. Future. Well, they're not a future liability. They're a current liability. If you've got a lot of little kids, what do you have? A lot of responsibility. A lot of mouths to feed. Food is an issue. Kids are hungry. Kids eat. Kids make messes. Kids tear stuff up. Kids require your attention. You know what kids don't do? Little kids, they don't work. They don't produce anything. All they do is take away from your bottom line. What's that? <laughs> we'll get there in a minute, Colby. <laughs> but yeah, kids were not considered a good thing. When I started out in grad work, I worked in a college ministry for a time. And, and in a college town, you can be the big college church. Most churches didn't want to be the big college church. 150, 200 college kids show up. You got to find seats for them. They're probably going to make a big mess. They want to be fed. Now, they'll eat pizza all day long, but they eat a lot of pizza. 
And, and you know, you got to be buying pizzas and Cokes and, you know, their schedules are weird. They want you to do stuff uh, to match their schedule. And just about the time you do all of that and you say, hey, we are so glad to have 150 college kids here. How about some of y'all help us out? They say, oh, it's break time. Bye. We'll see you in a few months. And they're gone. College kids don't give of their time or their money. They just consume resources. And so if you're a church and you said, hey, we want to be a big college kid church, that's a serious investment. And you have to really think about that. And I was part of a church that, that made a change. They went from having uh, about five college kids to, well, we ran about 150 college kids. And it was a massive commitment of budget, of time, uh, of staff, of all the resources the church had. And they got nothing out of it during those four years, basically. Why would a church do that? Invest in the future, Colby says. I can look back and just during the, the, the four or five years that I was there, I, I can now look back and that's been a long time ago. Uh, some of those college kids at that congregation, they have a handful of deacons that all came from that college group. They stayed in Nashville. They went to that church and now they're deacons. There's a, a two elders out of that group. They made an investment. Now, if you just looked in that four or five years, they didn't get anything. But long term, they got an investment. Look back at your bottom line. Why would children be a liability? Because they cost a lot up front. But it's an investment in the future. Those kids grow up. And they grow up enough that they get to be old enough they can help work and help support the family business. And they grow up some more and eventually they can take over the family business and expand the family business. What's that, Keith? Yeah, so that's what, yeah, Keith was saying that's, where the, that's the future. Eventually, they're worth it. In their culture, only one gender of children was worth that. Only males. Your boys would help work. Your boys would stay home. Your girls just grew up, ate all your food, took up all your time, and then somebody married them off, and they went to somebody else's house. And so in Roman culture, there were very few laws about children, first off. In the first two years of life, for whatever reason you wanted, you could take your two-year-old and under infant outside the city, set them down, and go back home and pretend like you didn't have a kid. And in, in the first, well, there really wasn't ever a rule about this, but socially acceptable time, all the way up to 10 years old. You could take your girl and just say, I, I can't afford you anymore, bye. And if your son was injured in such a way that he was never going to be able to contribute to the house, you could treat him like a girl. And, and so this culture didn't value children. They valued adults. Children didn't have rights. And, and even Jewish culture struggled with what to do to children. Now, they had a better view of children than Roman culture, they understood children were still made in the image of God. But it's hard to justify pouring all that money and time into a kid. And remember, life expectancy was not the same. And so you could pour all that in and then they could catch some disease and die before they ever contributed anything. And, and so people treated children differently. Children were virtually invisible in that society. And, and children, again, were, were a liability. You didn't want children. Uh, children were to be, to be seen and not heard and to be rarely seen. And, and, and that was kind of how they grew up. And Jesus calls a child, a little child, the word there, paideon, it, it refers to a, a toddler or an infant. He, he calls the kid to come to him. So it seems like this kid can walk. So it's not just a, a babe in arms, but this is a little kid. And he calls this kid to him and he sets him in the midst of them. Children are, are, again, not very valuable. In fact, likely this child had been around the whole time and nobody had noticed him except Jesus. And there's a whole lesson right there. Jesus sees the people we overlook. But to really understand how radical what Jesus says next is, you've got to understand how they just overlooked kids. Verse 3, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, Unless you are converted and become as little children, 
you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Just, just stop there. I know you can read on to verse 4 and 5, and we'll look at that in a minute. They said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What answer did Jesus give them? He's going to talk about a child, but before that, they said, who's the greatest? And Jesus said, let's not even talk about the greatest. Let's talk about what? Entering, whether you even get in. So they want to know, man, we're all in, but, but am I like number two, number three? Am I your right hand, your left hand? Am I number five, whatever? I'm, I'm jockeying for position here. And Jesus says, whoa, let's talk about whether you make it past the door. Unless you become like a little child, and, and again, we need to look at that, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You'll miss it. Number one, this is not the question they asked. But Jesus said it's a way more important question. You begin to see Jesus as the master teacher, and he redirects their focus. They were so focused on, am I better than, am I better than, how good am I? And Jesus said, the question you should be asking is, are you even going to make it through the door? Will you enter the kingdom of heaven? And what do they have to do if they want to enter the kingdom of heaven? Become as a little child. And in order for them to be, Sherry said that, by the way, in order for them to become as a little child, Jesus says, you're going to have to be converted. What does that mean? Change your ways, yeah. We're going to see humbled, yeah. So, so Jenny's skipping ahead just a little bit to verse 4. But, uh, but Jesus says, you've got to be converted. Now, what if somebody knocks on your door and says, hey, I'm here to convert you. What are they? Jehovah's Witness, yeah, okay. <laughs> or maybe a Mormon. They're for sure with some religious group, right? Unless you're like my neighbors who have a big Michigan sign in their yard, and I've tried to convert them multiple times. It hasn't worked yet. But yeah, they, they, if, if the language of conversion is, I want to change your beliefs. And most frequently when we think about conversion, it's a religious conversion. Anybody interested in converting? Good. Don't raise your hand at church. I, you know. But really, we're, we're not. If they knock on your door, hey, I'm here to convert you. Hey, I'm fine. I'm not interested in converting. I think I've got the truth. I've studied the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in being anything other than a Christian. I don't want to be converted to another religion. There's an instant aversion to that word. There's a good preacher term there. It's a conversion aversion. Okay, so, so there is, though. It's like, I, I don't want to be converted. And if you were to be converted, can you imagine how hard that would be? To, to leave behind everything. It's something completely new. Jesus says, you want to understand the kingdom of heaven? You want to even understand the, the way in through the door? You've got to be converted. And he uses that word for that radical change. You've got to be, uh, you, you've got to turn. The word there is, is strepho, and, and it's, you've got to change the whole direction of your life. You're going the wrong way. You've got to turn around and become as little children. Now, people have, people have made all kinds of stuff about what it means to become as a little child. Oh, you need to be like a little child. You know, they just, they love everybody. They trust so much. Little children, they, they just, they, they believe. They're so positive. If you make up all those stories about little kids, would you come to 8, 9, and 10-year-old week with me? I love little kids, but don't glorify little kids. Jesus tells us what we should follow about little kids. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to say, oh, you know, they, they, have, they, they forgive so easy. They, man, little kids can be vicious. They can be mean. They, they can be prideful. You put, a, you put a bowl of candy out there with not enough candy for all the little kids. 
And you see what happens. But Jesus says, there's a humility about little kids. Now, they may fight and they may squabble, but little kids do not worry about themselves at all. It's why at our week of camp with all the youngest ones, we have more staff than anybody else because we got to watch out for them. You, you put that bowl of candy at the bottom of a 10-foot drop, you know, here's a big wall and there's a bowl of candy down there. Whew, they gone. They're going to find a way. They'll be dropping off that wall all over the place. They don't worry about themselves. They will crawl anywhere, go anywhere, do anything, lick anything, touch anything. Yeah, there, there, there's a self-sacrifice there. Jesus says whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How did that little child, and he says this little child, how did that little child humble himself? Yeah, so there's a dependency there. Yeah. So, so Brad said little children are dependent. Even more so in their society where, where they didn't have rights and nobody was looking out for them. They were dependent on those who did look out for them. And he says, you've got to humble yourself like this little child. What had that little child done to humble himself? The only thing we know about that child, John said he obeyed Jesus' direction to come here. Look at what it says. Jesus called a little child to him. And the child came when Jesus called. Whatever that child was doing... Jesus said, come here, and the child stopped everything they were doing and came. I'll follow Jesus. Now take just a minute. What is it that Peter, and I'm picking on Peter because he kind of represents everybody. What is it that Peter needs to learn more than anything else? Remember what Jesus told him when Peter rebuked him? Jesus quit talking like that, and he says... Get behind me, Satan. And we talked about that. What was Peter's problem? It's not self-control this time. He's got too much self-control at this point. Why does he say, get behind me? He wasn't following. Peter, you've stepped in front of me. Your job is not to lead me. He stepped in front of Jesus. He said, no, Jesus, somebody's got to be the one to tell you this. You can't talk like this. You can't say this stuff. This is bad. I'm, I'm sorry, but I got to tell you, quit talking about dying and, all this, and, and being tortured. Jesus said, Peter, you don't lead, you follow. And, and we've seen, you know, you, you go back through, you, you look at the, the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter says, hey, we're going to build three shelters for Jesus, for Moses and Elijah. That's awesome. And the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Jesus is not like the rest. Peter, you follow him. Peter, and by extension, the disciples are learning what it means to follow. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Who gets to give all the orders? Who gets to be in charge? Who gets all the power? And Jesus says, little kid, come here. And the kid stops and comes here, comes here and he says, that's it. But Jesus, I want to do, but Jesus, this is what I think, but Jesus, come here and sit. Follow me. It's the very first thing he said to any of them. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That little child had dropped everything and followed Jesus. Now here's the crazy thing. You know who else had dropped everything and followed Jesus? Simon? So, what's that? Well, in the story here. Yeah, Peter, Andrew, James, and John left every, literally left everything. They're cleaning their nets. Sorry, Dad, we're going with the preacher. Matthew, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Jesus says, follow me, and he gets up. 
says, hey, I'm off the clock for good. Peter's, that's the words Peter's going to use in another situation. See, we have left everything and followed you. And so now we're arguing about who's the greatest and what do we get out of it and what's Jesus teaching them. That whole leaving everything and following is a daily decision that has to be renewed. Because you guys did leave everything, but you kind of forgot somewhere along the way. Whoever humbles himself as this little child to be great in God's eyes is to be humble. And that's why, Rodney, you compared being greatest in the kingdom of heaven to boasting about how humble you are. It's exactly what Jesus points out. So is it wrong to want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Yeah. You can't be great at being humble if you're bragging about it. I want to be pleasing to God. I don't care where I fall in the rankings after that. Paul's going to say, if I'm in the house, I don't care where, I don't care what my job is, I just want to be in God's house. He, he says, you know what, we, we have vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor, and I'll go empty all the vessels of dishonor if I'm in God's house. I'll be a doorkeeper in God's house, and I'll be happy. It's not I got to be the greatest, I just want to be in. Yeah, Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. Yeah, he, he's got a, an understanding of, look, it, I just want to be in. And so when they ask, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus redirects them to say, you need to be asking, will I enter the kingdom of heaven? And that's enough. And the one who humbles himself, that's the one who will be the greatest. And this little kid, by the way, he's going to hang with Jesus for a while. Jesus is going to make a lot of points off of this little kid. He teaches them first off about humility. Here's this little kid that dropped everything and came to, to sit with us to let me use him as an illustration. Verse 5, whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. He's going to talk now about, you want to talk about a little child. First off, let's ask if you get in. Second, let's ask. How do we treat each other? And that's really going to be the next section he enters into. Alan? What if you don't want to be great? Want to be great? Well, again, it's not a matter of being great or not being great. It's a matter of I want to be in the house. I want to be in the kingdom. And, and so you're right. The, the desire for greatness is not something. Jesus is going to say elsewhere, even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. And so if you want to be great, you need to want to be a great servant, to great, be great at serving others. But Jesus then says how you treat one another. So verse 5, he introduces the next theme. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Again, remember, they didn't see kids. They didn't pay attention to kids, especially not other people's kids. They barely paid attention to their own kids, but certainly not other kids. And Jesus says whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. How you treat children. How you treat those that nobody else looks at. How you treat the least of these is what Jesus is going to say in another story. Is how you treat me. So they're worried about being great and how they're going to treat each other. And we're going to talk about how we receive brothers. But Jesus says, you want to be like me? Who does Jesus care about? Keith says everybody. Theologically, you're not wrong, Keith, but in this passage, that's not Jesus' point. In this passage, Jesus says, I care about the folks that get overlooked and left behind and mistreated, the powerless and the weak. And if you receive one of these little children, if you take care of these, it's like taking care of me. And he's going to make that point some other ways in other places. But the bell rang, so we're going to pick up, we'll finish up that thought in verse 5 and then jump into some pretty powerful stuff starting in verse 6 as Jesus pronounces some serious destruction and desolation on a certain group of folks. So take a look at that and we'll be back there next week. Thanks for being in Bible class this morning.